a colony of penguins manages to thrive on the frozen end of our planet. The impossibly long neck of a giraffe gives it a near monopoly on the high leaves of the savanna. Such creatures represent miracles of evolution. Specimens so perfectly suited to their environments as to be unrivaled in their niche ecosystems. The great white shark, the American buffalo, the Ajima. The physical form of the Ajima is one of utilitarian rigour, born of necessity and harsh environments. Found exclusively in Korea, the confines of this geographical location have bred them smaller and more specialised, much like the ornery ponies which have also evolved on the peninsula. As the body becomes diminutive, the muscle tissue becomes stronger and more sinewy. This Ajima, although small, can lift several times her own body weight. The hair becomes a short coarse perm, which can act as an extra layer of epidermis and a scrubbing agent for housework. While they normally exude a plodding demeanour, they are fiercely territorial, and much like the honey badger in Africa, most other creatures clear out of their path for safety. The first recorded mention of the Ajima comes from a Portuguese trading vessel. Having left Formosa, modern day Taiwan, it was blown off course and landed in the southern city of Yosu. There, the sailors described in frightening tones, Little comparable in all of creation wilt thou find. They are cowed neither by fire nor steel, and even the tigers and leopards which roam these haunted vales give them a wide berth. From the fury of the Ajima, O Lord, deliver us. It has now been ascertained that the Ajima is produced from a miraculous metamorphosis akin to a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. As some Korean females approach a certain age, genetic triggers are activated, causing her to enter a coffee shop or some other climate controlled location. There she waits for the duration of Korea's four distinct seasons and then elbows her way out to join the wider world. The malted husks often continue to occupy the coffee shops with gormless expressions, clutching smartphones, mistakenly perceived to still be living beings. As they transition into full Ajimahood, their appearance is increasingly dominated by a dizzying array of floral and animal print patterns. Given that their ecosystem is primarily the grey concrete jungle of Seoul, it's long been an object of speculation as to why this should be so. First, the long-term evolution of the Ajima should be considered. Through the eons, they've adapted to the rolling hills and valleys of the mountainous Korean peninsula. There, amongst the blooming flowers and the foliage, the Ajima discovered the need for camouflage and secrecy. See if you can spot the Ajima concealed in this bed of flowers. Oh, watch as she stealthily slinks away. Secondly, they spend most of their waking hours in groups, known as a gaggle. The almost psychedelic combination of patterns and colours developed as a way to confuse and befuddle predators in the wild. Much like the zebra stripes, when this gaggle of Ajima rushes by, it can cause a sense of delirium in roaming carnivores. During that first encounter with Portuguese trading ships, the Ajima visors were thought to actually be part of their anatomy, but upon closer inspection were revealed to be much like the shell of a hermit crab. These exterior accoutrements function as both a barrier against the elements, but also as a formidable weapon. The edges of the visor are honed to a razor-sharp edge over the course of several years. Many an unsuspecting aggressor has been disemboweled by the angry flick of an Ajima's head. Moreover, 
the Visors act as a way to determine social rank and prestige in the social hierarchy. These senior Ajma, who have weathered several decades of rugged survival, typically adorn themselves with the largest and most impressive examples, even going as far as to festoon them with rhinestones and the like. For much of their evolution, the Ajma has primarily subsisted upon fruits, tubers and nuts. Foraging for food was a continual task and occupied most of their waking hours. What meat was consumed was usually the scraps of an animal carcass, such as the feet or intestines. This is due to the fact that their male equivalent, the Adjasi, usually made off with the choicest cuts first. These days they no longer are forced to scavenge for foodstuffs, but genetically feel a compulsion to engage in a rendition of the act. Hence, they can often be seen clustered around mounds of fabric and clothing in which they ceaselessly move items about and dig within. This is commonly misinterpreted as a kind of shopping, but rarely is anything bought. The Ajma frantically roots around until her urge has subsided, then ambles away to scout out her next conquest. Occasionally, a hapless bystander has fallen into their midst, and days later, their skeletal remains are recovered, often the bones picked clean. Their primary opponent for food and resources comes in the form of the Ajashi. The Ajashi, while full of stamina and vitriol, is nonetheless somewhat dim-witted. He enters what he perceives to be a long-term coupling, but in reality is her eliminating a competitor. For decades they engage in a sort of unspoken war of attrition. Then finally, after his physical prowess and faculties have weakened, he is lured into the wild and is set upon by a ferocious gaggle. Afterwards, they lounge about and revel in their victory. It is truly one of the happiest moments in the life of an Ajima. Join us next time for our special edition, Mating Calls of the Ajashi. Oh,